Let me get up on my, my speech of flying platform. KD Summit or just Summit. Um, when you were coming up the hill, maybe on the right side, you could see the old alignment of the highway as it kind of wound up through the, uh, the defile here that comes up over the pass. The highway was aligned well several times. One of those times was 1931. And in 1931, what they did was they aligned the highway in such a way that it cut off Goffs. So Goffs, which is going to be the end of our tour today, already had this, the schoolhouse was already there and a number of other, quite a few businesses were there. The highway department figured out that they could save six miles by cutting off Goffs and going, as far as I know, uh, straight on to, uh, uh, to Essex. And you can see the Essex cutoffs there. So that cut off Goffs, and those guys were pretty upset. In fact, they did everything they could to wheel and deal with the highway department, the road department, to try to get them to change their minds because you've got all kinds of businesses going on there. Well, six miles is six miles. It's six miles of less pavement that you have to maintain and all that. So it ended up that Goffs did get bypassed. Well, some of the buildings from Goffs were then brought up here. And... Um, Two of the people that brought up one of the buildings was uh, George and Minnie Tienkin. And uh, up here, they uh, was established a cafe and a number of tourist cabins, as well as a service station uh, right here. Now, right up over there, to my right, your left, or behind you, whatever way you guys are facing. <laughs> you can see the steps going up to the uh, to where the cafe was. Now, the cafe eventually burned down. But if you look at your history guide, uh, you will see a picture of the cafe with a couple of cars, and even a, a car with a teardrop type trailer on the back of it. Also in the 1930s, as you know, because we were just at one, you know, that, that, uh, that emergency landing strip over at uh, Baghdad where we just dedicated the monument. In the 1920s, a number, quite a few of those emergency landing strips were established by the, by the federal government. Uh, a lot of the airmail routes came through this area. There's one called Kelly Field, which is way up uh, on the other side of Sema Dome, you know, on Interstate 15 at about where uh, Valley Wells is. There's Kelly Field was there. There's quite a number of other ones. These were emergency strips laid out by the government. And that's what that one over at Baghdad, Baghdad was. They also established a number of beacons. And the, there was a beacon here at Summit. So I make sure I don't bust myself up. And, and the foundations of which are right up on, uh, we are right up on this hill. In fact, just below the cross, you can see a small concrete pad. That's one of the bases for the uh, for the beacon that was here, from what I understand. Um, at any rate, we have the cafe there. You probably figure that cold storage right up over there. Uh, if it isn't, it sounds like a good story. Uh, <laughs> on the gas pump island right over there. Garage right here. A lot of uh, local artists come out here to express themselves, as you can see. Um, what's that? Yeah, yeah, those guys. As we continue on, oh, hey, it's one of those things. Oh, that's a nice one. It's coming this way, fellas. Get your shotgun. Get your shotguns out. Everybody say hi. <laughs> as we, everybody hi. say hi. <laughs> As we continue on east, we're going to start hitting the uh, the bypasses to these bridges. So just take it slow. The bypass goes around to the right side of the bridge through a wash and back up onto the pavement again. So just take it slow and easy through those. Um, it's kind of a thing I, I believe I mentioned at the drivers' meeting that we're told that. Uh, it's been scouted out and checked, but not by me. But I heard it from another guy who heard it from a dude who said that his buddy went through there with his uncle about a year ago, and it was okay. So, like I said, keep your eyes open and take it slow through there. Um, we'll be heading down towards Danby, and uh, there's a BLM pullout. I keep saying BLM. It was actually a highway department pullout uh, that's got some interesting BLM plaques on it. We'll stop there. Uh, I believe that's next. Do that or Danby, I can never remember which. Anyway, just follow the guy in my blue truck, and we'll be okay. Did you have a Oh, okay. All right. From what I understand from reading from, uh, there's a guy named Matt Bishop who wrote a book. Uh, he 
he's a BLM archaeologist. He wrote a neat book called Life in the in the Past Way. It's a history of Route 66 through the East Mojave Desert. And uh, I think it comes, yeah, it comes in two volumes. And the volume for this area, uh, I had the trying to think, because it was quite a while ago, is when Cass Ellsworth did his trip as Vice Humbug. So it must have been around 08, 09, somewhere in there. <laughs> I remember I checked out a copy of it from the LA Library, the main branch in downtown. How much uh, do you owe now? Yeah, for that's fees. what I'm trying to calculate because it's still <laughs> on my shelf. Anyway, <laughs> it's a really cool book. I was kidding about all that part, but um, uh, it's because I see all these cameras. <laughs> uh, the guy in the airplane He's looking for you. He wants his book. What are you in for? Oh, murder. How about you? Oh, grand larceny. How about you? Uh, I just returned a library book. <laughs> so anyway, um, actual pavement from Route 66 there. And then behind you, you can see a couple of spots of the concrete where there's I-beams that stood at where, it, where, where once stood a canopy for people to come and get out of the, the, the heat have a picnic lunch and that kind of thing. Now the, the rock, the, the reason I wanted to stop here, we'll spend an extra couple of minutes here if you want to check them out, but we'll keep it reasonable time-wise, is that if you look down below here, you can see a number of rock alignments. The rock alignments were made by soldiers, troops that were training out here. Our first thought, when we started exploring around in here, our first thought that, oh, it must be part of Patton's Desert Training Center. What it actually is, we found out later was from a, a, a deal called Operation Desert Strike, which is a training exercise in the 1960s, I want to say 65. 63, 64. 63, 64. There you go. Okay, and ex noble Grand Humbug and my good friend uh, uh, Jim Jackson, JJ, did his plaque down near Needles on Desert Strike back in, he was Humbug, right? I was his vice, so it would have been 2006 that he did that. And you had, and I can't tell you too much about the history of that because that's not my, my my specialty, but you had tens of thousands of soldiers, Sid might know more about it or, or um, uh, Greg here, uh, out here, uh, and there was, it was supposed to be a war game between, I guess, the United States and the Soviets, and they uh, they were practicing all kinds of tactics and crossing them off the Colorado River with tanks and all that kind of cool shit. So anyway, the number of the rock formations are from that period of time, not not uh, from World War II. So I wanted to stop here so that you can see this and also see those rock alignments because they are pretty cool. So uh, we got about, if you want to take about 10 minutes to explore down in that area, there's also some old beat up cars down in that, that dirt pile over there. Uh, so check out those rock alignments if you want to. Have a, uh, a road cola if you would like. Then we'll get back on the road in about 10 minutes. The, 10 desert, minutes. the desert exercise had 26 deaths, and the military said it was a smashing success. Oh, yeah. 26 humans died. Most of them drowned in the Colorado River because they were testing out new gear. Well, they opened the dam up, so the river was full speed ahead the night before they had walked through. Well, the next day, they got 90 pounds of equipment, and away they went. Yeah. But only 26 people died, so it was a successful yeah, it went real well. training Target. mission. Yeah. <laughs> right, so we'll leave in about 10 minutes. Edson started out as a uh, as a siding on the railroad in 1883. When we were way back there at... Um, uh, where were we? Back then, I was talking about the railroad, and that the railroad was completed in 1883. So you'll see things like Amboy. Now, this is an interesting thing. Amboy will say that it's founded like sometimes in the 1850s, but nobody really knows why it's, it says that. It just does. Probably, really, it was established in 1883 when the railroad came through. Ed, uh, Edson, which is what this was before it was Ed, Essex, was established as a siding in 1883 as well. Edson. And the name was changed in 1906 to Essex. And uh, this is, uh, I knew somebody was going to ask why. Because that's what they felt Sound like. like my kid. <laughs> why? Yeah, because there was a guy named Essex, and uh, there was a ship called the Essex. And he was on the ship. And, you don't believe me, do you? No. Okay. <laughs> good lie. It's good Sounds lie. Good. Is that where they get the Essex? <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly it. So, uh, when Rob... When the National Trails Highway came through, and then Route 66 in 1926, um, the highway department established a maintenance facility here, 
And as you probably saw, there is a maintenance facility down on the west end of town. They also establish a, a well slash fountain. And if you happen to be, when you were driving into town just now, just as you come in, the first kind of grove of trees on the right side, you can actually see where the well slash fountain is. And it looks like the classic well from a cartoon with a, you know, a stone ring and a little roof over it like that. Anyway, water used to flow there. I don't know if it still does. I've never actually stopped to see if water is still available there. But it was for quite a while. Uh, then uh, later on, a, uh, a guy named Blythe Homestead is near here. He opened a service station. Cafes were opened here. There was a couple of service stations. We happen to be standing underneath one right now. And it became a pretty active place. In fact, uh, when I talked about the realignment of, of 66 in 1931, that bypass Fenner and Goffs, uh, it was good news for Essex because all of the business that was going to Goffs, to Goffs and Fenner was now coming here. Okay? Because this is where you, you didn't have to go all that distance around to the gas stations at, at Goffs and Fenner. And this would be the first place after Needles that was any of any real significance. Also, you have the road that comes in from Mitchell's Caverns. Mitchell's Caverns is up there in the Providence Mountains inside of the uh, boundaries of the uh, Mojave National Preserve. And uh, uh, that was that's quite a popular place. The Mitchell family established that, as I recall, in the 1930s, and then it was finally they finally donated it to the to the government, and uh, now it's a state excuse me to the state government, and now it's a state park. It closed for a while when California had some budget budget issues in the earlier in the 2000s, and now it's open again for tours and. Uh, <laughs> For me, the only t a little story about that real quick. I've been to Mitchell Caverns twice with Dennis K. Spears' group, the friend of the friends of the Mojave Road. Uh, but I've never been in Mitchell Caverns because each time we went, it was a it was a kind of a thing where, where we're running a trail and said, "Hey, let's go to Mitchell Caverns." Well, cool. Well, I always travel with a dog when I'm not clamping, and they don't let dogs into Mitchell Caverns. So I was had to wait outside while everybody else went on inside. It reminds me also uh, of. Yeah. Uh, I was also reminded when we were at Shambles uh, afterwards, as we were driving this way, Sid was talking about firing anvils, and this has nothing to do with Route 66, but rather with firing anvils. And on our flyers, as you have seen, it always says no guns, no knives, no winters, no firing of anvils. But when I came to Clambers, I never, I had no idea what that meant. But I was too shy; I didn't want to ask anybody to look dumber than I already am to ask somebody, what does it mean to fire an anvil? So when I was the recorder for the chapter, uh, as most of you know, I teach high school, um, I had a freshman homeroom, and I picked a student to do all the paperwork. You know, back then, I didn't, we didn't use Excel and all the stuff we use now for clampers. It was just an accordion file, and those guys would send in their, their rub and their little flyer thingy. Um, I'd have this, this freshman high school student, an African-American girl, and she would do all the filing for me. And she'd put the checks in one pile, do everything alphabetically. And one day she looks at the fire and says, firing of anvils? Wow, Mr. Renner, you guys fire anvils? And I said, well, I got to tell you, I don't remember her name because it was a long time ago. I got to tell you, I don't really know what that means. And she goes into this whole lesson. Like, what you do is you take one anvil, the other one's got to be smaller, and then you take some peanut butter and put it on the car to see a little gunpowder. And it's really cool. And it goes, well, how do you know about this stuff? Well, I go back to my family reunion back east. You know, every year we have a big picnic and somebody fires an anvil. That's how I learned about what firing in a banana is. At any rate, as far as I know, I believe there are still folks living here because I see some modern day cars. Here's a little, another one. Now, I can't remember if this happened in 06 when I did my heavy here or if it happened in 2019 when I did a dam trek. But we were talking right here, and I think Sid was talking, and maybe Bill Pearson was here too. And a fella comes out from around the side of the building, and he it looked like if if he didn't have a shotgun, he had, like, the look of a shotgun in his eyes. <laughs> what are you guys doing here? This is private property, and, and you need to go. And somebody turns around and says, you want a beer? The guy goes, yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you guys want to look around? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, Bribery. <laughs> and, of course, when, Rob, when, Rob, when Interstate 40 was open, which you can see right over there, Essex didn't dry up quite as much as the other places did. 
because it is still fairly close to the highway. If you needed a tire, this is the way where you had to come. In fact, the scooter was telling me, was it, was it Briny, Wood? Briny Woods? Briny Woods. Had to come here. Gay Ray. Gay Ray had to come here for a, uh, not that Ray, Gay Ray. <laughs> the, the real Gay Ray right yeah. here. Oh, there he is. <laughs> I had to come here for a tire, I'm told. I'm not sorry about it, Ray. <laughs> you and I are here. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It all comes off in the shower. Right, right there. Right there. Right right there. Right now, there. Sid over here has got some, uh, some more information, including information on camp passing, right? Okay, well, uh, the first thing to talk about is the Mitchell Caverns deal because we have a plaque at Mitchell Caverns and when we originally wanted to put the plaque up we arranged with the ranger the state ranger to put the plaque up and we gave it to him and we came back up and he wasn't there anymore and we said where's our plaque and they said huh what plaque well we found that plaque in the state office historical office in Sacramento and it was sent down to us, but they didn't give us permission to put the plaque up. So if you go up the road toward Mitchell Caverns, I've been up there in a bit, but at a Y in the road, that, that plaque is down like in a small mound on the ground and we put it up there <laughs> on the way to do the plaque at Camp Rock Springs. And uh, the interesting story about the Mitchell uh, Cavern's clamp out was we used to have a guy named Jack LaBounty who was an over the road truck driver and he had his own semi in his own van and at this point in time the the Mojave Desert was not in the preserve and so there were free roaming cattle and one of the things that was a problem out here for the ranchers evidently were guys would come up with semi trucks you know closed vans and Russell cattle. So Jack came in during the night and parked his truck and we're we're all sitting around doing something and these ranchers came up with rifles <laughs> <laughs> and were accusing us of cattle rustling. So Jack opened his van and of course it was clean. It was obvious animals had not been in there. But it was like, wow, I didn't know people wrestle cattle, you know, into vans. To me, it's still back there in gun smoke, you know. So while we were there, we came down to Essex. And I, I'd have to look at a history book. Were you at Mitchell Caverns for that dedication, Bill? I don't think so. So I can't tell you the year, but it, it was probably the 80s. Uh, no, I'll bet you it was the 70s. We came down here, and this was open. This was a going concern. And I remember one of the guys called home from a payphone here, and there was gas pumps here. There was a tire repair place. There was like a little store or something where you could buy drinks. And it was like, wow, we've reached civilization. <laughs> so the next time I really spent any time in Essex, was Bill Pearson, ex Noble Grand Humbug, who is co founder of Hemorrhoid and the Vituscan Missionaries. He has a double mantle. Uh, he's pretty ill right now, but uh, he was really involved. He was the guy that got us involved in the Mojave Road, and he's the guy that got us involved in the uh, California Maneuver Area. You probably don't know what that means, that means Patton's Training Camp. So I'm leading up to the story. Patton's training camp went from approximately Shiraco Summit all the way into Arizona, all the way from above Searchlight, Nevada, all the way to the Mexican border down to Yuma. It was a huge training area. And uh, Shiraco Summit, which has the Patton Museum, when I joined Clampers, Remember, we were still using oxen to cross the desert. <laughs> that wasn't called Shiraco Summit. That was called Schaefer's Summit. Shiraco bought that property, and where the cafe is, if you've been there, that is where General Patton made his 
headquarters for the training center. Patton was only here a very short time. I mean, he went off to North Africa, but that training center lasted until 43 or 44. That, um, oh, the story about that is, so Patton establishes his camp, right? And he goes to, I guess it's the Metropolitan Water District, and he says, well, we need to use some of the water out of the aqueduct. And they said, well, we're going to have to have a board meeting and decide whether you can have the water. Pat says, don't worry about it, we're already taking it. <laughs> so, Bill is really interested in this, like he was in the Mojave Road. So, I knew nothing about the Mojave Road. I knew nothing about that as a training center. But we get involved, and Bill says, we need to go and meet with this guy the Needles BLM office? Yeah. The Needles BLM office in Essex because we're going to look at where we can camp to put up a plaque to Camp Essex. If you've been at Clamper long enough in our chapter, you know that we've got these monuments at almost all the desert training centers in California, and we have worked with um, Arizona Lost Dutchman to put up the plaques at uh, Baus. So we came out and met this guy, and we went over there, and that's where Camp Essex was. And uh, so he showed us a spot, and we, we camped out here, and he said that all the mounds of dirt that we saw were where they had buried stuff after World War II when they closed the camps. But you couldn't dig for them because it was illegal from the Antiquities Act. Before the um, Desert Protection Act, and before that all got included, I remember going with clampers out along um, is it 177 that runs, 62 that runs to Parker? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I remember going out there, and there's a um, rice airfield and rice out by Rice Road. Yep. I remember you could dig around. I remember finding uh, old batteries, um, Fitch's uh, hair oil, razor blades, all that stuff. So out here somewhere, supposedly, is that World War II Jeep you heard about that you could buy for 50 bucks. <laughs> it's still in the crate. So. From that time of Mitchell Cameras to when we came out here and did Camp Essex, this area had declined so much, I remember that the guy from the BLM and, uh, and Bill and I went someplace down here and bought sodas, and that's all there was in this place, was a small area and the maintenance uh, thing. Uh, we have done a lot of camping out here, obviously in the California maneuver area, because we have plaques all over. Uh, but. Um, you know, this is this was a going place, and when we came from Mitchell Caverns, and then it just like here it is. I remember using the phone here. I remember the gas pumps here. I remember I, I was almost going to say this was a Chevron station. I remember buying gas here, and I remember the tire repair place. Thank, Thank you, Sid. So you guys know. The very first CHP officer in 1929 was badge number one, and they keep going up. I'm 11,661, 38 years ago. Badge number 275 was Buzz Banks. That's his name. If you guys get a chance, his book's on eBay now. They're about 10 or 20 bucks. Called Patrolling the East Mojave by Buzz Banks, 275. And there are little short stories out here. When Buzz graduated from the CHP Academy, he was issued a Coleman Lantern, one gallon of fuel, and a Harley Davidson motorcycle. Yeah. That was it. He lived in the house where our check in is right now. The Coleman Lantern was to be a heater in the car that he was going to get in four years. <laughs> Serious shit. And so he would have to stop his motorcycle and a sleeping bag and sleep out here because he'd have to go out to a fatal accident on that motorcycle. He would light bushes on fire to try to get feeling back in his hand. Patrolling the East Mojave from Buzz Banks. He went from the Colorado River 
all the way to Hesperia was his beat all by all, all by himself. Uh, the Boyston boys are here. Tyler is in the academy right now. I got him in. And he's gonna his batch number will be twenty three thousand something. So anyway, Buzz Banks was number two seventy five. What year was Buzz? Oh, but oh, Buzz, geez, he started uh, before World War II, and he went all all worked up to the seventies. He had a long he had a long career. His uh, relatives are still alive. Turbo wanted to uh, do a plaque for him, but it's it's in the in the future. We're gonna put it up. I think now our plaque is gonna change away from uh, Lawman of the East Mojave. I think we're gonna do something for Albert Okura. I think he yes. he'll get the next damn. We're gonna do another plaque for for Albert because we the, that campground is just right, right, is right, the right. bomb. Hey, so where were guys? Uh, if you didn't, yeah, it, I know if you weren't at the drivers meeting this morning. When we pull into the golf schoolhouse, we're, we're gonna drive in real slow. We'll pass the lunch area. You'll see that, but we're gonna go to the stamp mills in the back. That'll be our first stop in the back. We're gonna do a quick little blessing of our other plaque that construction's underway right now if you guys can please join this association it's a little secret i'll let you in on it's 35 bucks a year sid blumner gave him a thousand bucks thank you sid yeah. uh, they're struggling to stay open so when clampers join you can call the director uh, laura or ariel the manager and say hey i'm a clamper full hookups for your rv for absolutely free they have a dozen trailers you can stay in a travel trailer hey i'm a clamper Come on out, and it's a it's it's a, a, a bitchin' place. So yeah. third week of April is your deal. First class miners yep. are gonna do a, a for for the rendezvous. So try to try to make it out for that. Will Sid they be Lumber. running the stamp mill anytime soon? They're, well, they they need four millmen by law, and there's only ten in the United States of America. I mm -hmm. think there's gonna be three here, so they need another. I think I'm gonna bullshit them and tell them John Tiago is certified. You have to be federally certified to run stamp mill. Oh, and uh, they are, uh, yeah, the one guy passed away, Charlie, his name's going to be on the plaque. And then, uh, yeah, so they might be short of millman, so they might just have to talk about it. But they had him running last week. The lady who's supposed to be there, her house in Yorba Linda is flooded. So, nah. Nah. so the visual cameras plaque was just pointed out to me was 1977. And when Mitchell Caverns closed down for the state, because the state is so fucking smart, <laughs> All the electrical wiring was <laughs> tore out of there, yeah. stolen. And Mitchell came out here and bought that property and ran that as a private concession. And the state tried to get it from him, and uh, no. And then he gave it to him when he passed. Well, there is a book called, uh, I think it's called Jack Mitchell Caveman, by him or Caveman, and you can read room, about it. But what is it? Keeper of the Cave. Keeper of the Cave. I have that. Anyway, that plaque was 1977. Wow. Nice. That was, that was the year before I was born. Golf. There are a couple things on golf, in case you don't know. ex of my uncle Grand Humbug West Beaver was a humbug, and when we did a, a uh, camp out at Rattlesnake Mine, because of issues after the BLM approved the plaque for Paiute. Yeah, for Fort Paiute, because of what they decided we were, we were if the days turns, we weren't wokey enough for them. <laughs> so that was our first plaque at the golf schoolhouse. Okay, so you just be aware. And the second plaque is a military plaque to one of the patent divisions. I think there's a third one, but I can't remember that. Yeah, so when you're driving in there, that's why the, that's why we're attached like that with them. And Dennis Casebeer, who founded this whole Mojave thing, he was a Billy Hope. Hey, Dr. Dennis Casebeer and Hugh Brown into the Clampers in his living room in his house across the street from the uh, uh, from the Goff Schoolhouse. It's myself. Uh, Neil Sampson and uh, uh, Rick Gavigan. Who else was there? You were there. Ray was there. A couple of others of us. And he sat down. Thought it was just the funniest thing he had ever heard. As many of you have as well. Hugh <laughs> Brown was a like a director out there. Yeah, he was real good. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Hugh was a good guy. He. Um, can you tell those guys to be quiet with that? <laughs> uh, anyway, that. So what we're going to do is we're going to head to now to Goffs. If you need gas, ice, 
potato chips, whatever. You can stop in Fenner and get some before you walk up to the counter. There's a little kiosk there with a loan agent where you can get a second on your house so that you can buy the gas, beer, ice, chips, and so on at Fenner. If you have to, do that. Now, if you... Uh, or do it on the way out. I was just going to say, it would be better to do it on the way out, but if you absolutely have to have it, it's there. And then if you, if you do that, uh, when you exit Fenner, you'll take a ride on Old 66, and the next little spot up is Goff's. Landfair Road comes in to 66 there at Goff's. You'll take a left and then go right into the back of the facility, like, like Scooter said. Um, so we're going to be taking a real old alignment of 66. This is the part that was cut off in 1931. When we got it down a little bit further, you'll see a stop sign. The road to the right was the, the later alignment that went uh, straight to here. Do not go to the right. When you guys came up the road and you saw those buildings, if you looked at the sign, you said Danby Road. That's new Danby. Old Danby is down by the railroad track, mm -hmm. and the Justice of the Peace building from Old Danby is up at Goff. Yeah. Now, one yeah. final thing. If you think gas is expensive at Ludlow okay. yeah. or uh, Amboy, when you leave Fenner, you will think that was a discount bargain. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys, you don't have, uh, a lot of you don't have four-wheel drives, but we can't do it all. I've been on so many trips out here with this wonderful organization. Half mile that way is a, like a mile long airstrip. There's water reservoirs. When you go into the Golf's property, when you look, when you see the alignments of rocks, that's World War II training. They still have green rock on the ground where officers would walk on the green rock the soldiers could not, and those it's all over right in back of the train station at Golf. Take take a look at it when when you when you drive in. Heck yeah! All right, that's it. Salut.